Hello, everyone. Welcome to our day six of our online conference, um, the Taos Institute Gathering, Unfolding Dialogues, Relational Resources for Global Good. We have this week long series of virtual events that we've been really excited about and we are already on day six. I am Dawn Dole, the Executive Director of the Taos Institute and your Zoom host for today's Global Plenary. For those of you who don't know, the Taos Institute is a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to developing, sharing, and expanding social constructionist theory and practice. We focus on relational, collaborative, appreciative, and dialogic practices. We bring together scholars, practitioners, students, and the curious from very various disciplines like organization change, leadership, education, therapy, healthcare, research, and more. We have many publications, both printed and free downloads. We offer workshops and conferences, a diploma program, dialogue with the authors, and we have many, many resources on our website. And um, Alex is putting the link to our website in the chat at this time. This week, we have over 60 events happening in a variety of languages at a variety of time zones and hosted by people from around the globe. We have people joining us this week from 37 countries. And we're all here to explore, learn, share, and co-create practices from the local to the global that focus on how social constructionist ideas and practices can help us create and bring forward new ways of going on together in a world facing global challenges in this ever increasingly volatile and complex world. We need innovative ideas and practices of promise for our ways of relating now more than ever so thank you for joining us in this week-long adventure. And now we are very excited about our daily global connection plenary today called Research in Multiple Worlds. Our hosts for this session are Sally St. George and Dan Wolf. And our guests are researchers from three different locales, David Gallant from Australia, Francis Akama from Uganda, and Norma Ram from South Africa. Today, they will discuss thoughts prompted by a few questions, and Sally and Dan will be going over those. Given the importance of conducting research for change making, what are the areas of practices you think we need to pay attention to and alter in designing those projects? What do you think we need to pay more attention to and alter in shaping the reports of those research projects? So I'd like to bring Dan and Sally on spotlight now and introduce them. So Dan and Sally are a couple who have had the privilege of working together, teaching, writing, and presenting for several decades. Dan is Professor Emeritus and Sally is Professor Emerita of the, from the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary in Canada. Their academic specialty has been engaging in and teaching social work and family therapy practice. Dan and Sally have considered the Taos Institute the professional home since the very first Taos conference. And we won't say how long ago that was, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> and now they serve on the Taos Institute Board of Directors. They also both have been part of the Qualitative Report, which is an online open access journal team since, the 19, since 1996, taking on many different roles and including re reviewing, editing, and mentoring new reviewers and authors. Over the years, they have been invested in qualitative inquiry as it relates to practice. Together, they developed research as daily practice to help practitioners utilize and develop new knowledge based on the systemic examination of their practice questions that is in line with the ways in which they practice. So welcome, Dan and Sally. Thank you for hosting our time today. Thanks, Dawn. Um, we're happy to be here and to be talking about research in um, multiple worlds. And we would really like to start with um, David. 
Um, thanks, uh, Sally and Dan. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to kick us off with uh, an important acknowledgement to country. Uh, for many people, um, it's something you may be familiar with. Uh, for those that aren't, um, it's an important opportunity for us to be able to show our respect um, to traditional custodians on the lands on which we meet. We know that colonisation has impacted many First Nations peoples around the globe and by continuing on a practice of acknowledgement, uh, recognising those people uh, existing living cultures. For me in Australia, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the oldest living culture on this earth. So uh, for me, it's very important to do so um, without sort of talking more to that point, I might just start and yeah. Palingana, Mina, David, um, from the northwest of Tasmania. I'm an Aboriginal man. Uh, I grew up in that uh, small island nation uh, to the south of the mainland Australia. Uh, for me, not being um, of the country I'm living now, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners uh, of the Wurundjeri people, the traditional custodians on the land on which I'm meeting you with. Um, and I would welcome everybody to add into the chat uh, the traditional owners that you may be aware of on the lands on which you are uh, dialing into this call uh, so that we may recognise them as well across the chat. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past and present, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Indigenous peoples' enduring connection to the land, their care for the land, uh, and the care for the people on which the land that we all live on. So thank you, Sally and Dan. Thank you, David, for starting us um, with that acknowledgement. Um, and we do encourage everybody to put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, our, uh, this is to be like a panel discussion. And so what we have asked um, Francis, David, and Norma to do is to answer two questions. And we'll repeat those questions. Um, after everybody introduces themselves. And since we have, I think, a kind of a nice size of a group, um, instead of going into individual uh, discussions, we would just invite you to ask questions and join us as we talk about um, our ideas as we go along, okay? So um, we invite the three of you to introduce yourselves in the ways that you most would like. Should we start with David or with? Uh, who, um, David, would you like to add something else okay. about yourself? Sure. We'll start with David. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and the patience of Norma and Francis for letting me go again. Look, um, <laughs> I'm a, a lecturer and a director of engagement within the Department of Social Work at the University of Melbourne. I've been really lucky uh, to be working uh, within the university for the last seven years, um, mostly as a researcher, but uh, more recently uh, coming across into the teaching teams as well. And so particularly with my uh, First Nations background and cultural background, teaching social workers how to interact uh, with Indigenous uh, communities, but also thinking about ways of, of knowing and working um, from an Indigenous lens. So not just about working for communities, it's actually working in a particular way. Most of my research background has been uh, within custodial environments. So recently completing my PhD about two years ago, looking at the role of sport and physical activities within the prison system within Australia uh, and more broadly. Um, and also my other research um, is in family violence. Unfortunately, Australia, like many other countries around the globe, have um, an absolute pandemic in a way around uh, the issues of family violence, particularly um, the terrible outcomes for women and children in this country. At the moment, a woman is um, murdered at the hands of um, mostly males uh, once every 10 days. And so a lot of that research is looking at how do we work with uh, communities and particularly men in the work that I do around how do we get them to uh, be accountable for their behaviour around family violence, but more importantly, how do we get them to come on a journey of change? So um, that's probably enough about me. Thank you. Thanks, David. And uh, Francis and Norma, you're kind of combo today, so <laughs> let's go forward. Okay, so maybe I, I can start. See, I'd requested that I introduce, uh, and I hope uh, that is still the request. I hope it's still standing. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for welcoming us to this conference. I am really excited about it. I'll go straight to the introduction and come back late and speak about um, uh, what I prepared, what I have today in terms of uh, 
contributing to the conversation. I'll start by introducing Norma, uh, who is not feeling very well. She has to minimize the use of her voice. So I'll try as much as possible to be a spokesperson a little bit and most of the part be my own spokesperson. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, Norma is a professor at the Department of Adult Community and Continuing Education in the Faculty of Education at the University of South Africa. Uh, she is a South African critical system thinker and she has vested interest uh, in transformative research. And if you Google her, you'll see a lot of our work are based on the issues of transformation, indigenous knowledges, and of course, society transformation among others. And she was also uh, at some point the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Swaziland. She also served as the Deputy Director of the Center for System Studies at our university in the United Kingdom. Uh, Norma is widely published in our areas of expertise, and these include, but not limited to uh, books that she produced, uh, book chapters, articles in high impact journals, and she participated in multiple research projects, uh, at least as far as I know, that contribute directly to society transformation. Uh, on a personal level, uh, colleagues, I'm so pleased to let you know that Norma uh, uh, I, has been my mentor when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of South Africa. So I worked closely with uh, implementing research project in indigenous communities. And I have also conducted recent two major research projects with Norma in Uganda. And this focus primarily on the issues of uh, social justice and the issues of indigenous social movement uh, and the issue of social and, uh, and environmental justice. So uh, our project has, has been published widely and it's being used uh, across the, the globe and at some point we may share with the members. So colleagues, I am not really best place to talk about Norma, but this is briefly what I can tell you. I invite you to join me in welcoming her to this conversation. And uh, having done that, let me now speak briefly about myself. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Francis Akena Adiyanga. I am a senior lecturer and the Dean of the Faculty of Education at Kabale University in Uganda. I have previously studied and worked at the University of Toronto. And later I did my postdoctoral fellowship at the University of South Africa. And like I mentioned, while I was there, Pro Professor Norma Rom was my immediate supervisor. I'm sorry, my immediate mentor. Uh, my teaching and research interests are in indigenous knowledge, social and environmental justice, equity and diversity in education. So I'm really excited to be contributing to this conversation because they fit right into the areas that I'm so passionate about. I thank you and I beg to stop here at this point. Thank you. Um, let's just add a couple words before we get into the substance of what uh, David and Francis and Norma are going to share with us is that uh, Sally and I have come to know these three people relatively recently. Um, David, we met just this summer in uh, Rwanda at a conference and uh, co-presented with him at the University of Rwanda in Kigali. And, you know, we got along famously. And so we kind of just continued to interact and have these times together. So we're really excited to kind of talk with him again and, and share what he has to say in this forum. Um, Francis and Norma, I've come to know uh, primarily through being an editor for an article or two that they've done for the qualitative report. And it's been very, and I reviewed a book that Norma had uh, written. So we really think that they present uh, lots of ideas about how research kind of in this time and place in the world can be more responsive to different people's marginalized issues and cultures around the world. And so their work has been uh, a very specific example of how you can do that. So I'd encourage people to take a look at uh, Norma's book and some of the articles that they, Francis and Norma have done together, particularly in TQR, the qualitative report. I think they're really, specific practical examples of how you can make good on these values and beliefs that we kind of are going to champion and talk about, but it's kind of, can you make them come alive? And I think Francis and Norma have demonstrated the ability to do that. So just wanted to say a little bit about our contact. Uh, we've come to know these three great people. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, 
like I like we said before, we had posed a couple of questions to our panelists and would ask them to just discuss. And we will also pose the same questions to you, those of you who have come to listen and hopefully to offer your answers as well, because we think that research um, could use an improvement and, and, and development as we always go along. We always um, say to our authors that we think the best research, uh, the best researchers not only advance content knowledge, they also advance the ways in which we conduct our research. And so we think this is important on both fronts and we're looking forward to hearing what our three guests have to say as well as um, our other participants. So let me just put the questions out there again and then- Who's gonna start? It, I'm gonna start with the questions and then anybody who would like to speak can speak, Okay. all right? So the questions we posed were, um, given the importance of conducting research for change making, what are areas or practices that you think we need to pay more attention to or alter in designing those projects? And the second question was, can you hold can you hold for a second? Um, did you post them in the chat because I didn't find them? Oh, well, you know what? we can do that. Yes, we can do that. That would be great because yeah. I cannot, I am very limited in my memory. I cannot remember that. That's a, them. That, that's a good uh, suggestion. Thank you. Dan's going to do that right now. Dan's going to pay attention to the chat. I can't pay attention to listening and the chat at the same time. So he, he can do that. Um, the second question is, what do you think we need to pay more attention to or alter in sharing the reports of those projects? So. We're anxious to hear what you think. Uh, okay. uh, Francis, I just want to quickly mention the reason that we decided to talk about the indigenous paradigm is because often in academia and in people's thinking about research, this isn't given much credibility. Mm. So, so we're trying to recredentialize it. Okay. So uh, do you want me to dive in now? Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. So yeah, like Norma did mention, so basically colleagues, we, uh, Norma and I, like I said in the introduction, we did a study in the year 2000, first of all, when I was at the University of South Africa, 2016 slash 2017, and then later when I came to and started working at Kawala University, we kept uh, in close conversation and we did some project together uh, between the time of COVID-19 2020 and 2021. So we conducted research uh, in indigenous community here in Uganda, but then we were also trying to see the applicability of our research to a broader society beyond the Ugandan context and also beyond indigenous community. So what came out clearly uh, is the profound importance of having what we call a paradigm shift in as far as the conduct of research is concerned. Because we say the paradigm is often not given enough space, which is indigenous paradigm on what Chilisa called the paradigmatic dance floor. And the reason why we, and we talk, we look at this from four major uh, uh, indigenous philosophy, that is the four R's, which is the relational ontology, uh, and then we have the relational epistemology, the relational axiology, and the, rela and the relational methodology. So we had our research constructed around these four R's, the, the, the ontology, epistemology, axiology, and the methodology. The big question that we ask ourselves is, how are the research participant embedded in the practice of research, research for the objective of community transformation? And so how do we design research in a way that take care of the interests of the community? And how does it take care of the relationship that we construct in community and how do this relationship contribute to making society a better way, a better one? And the kind of knowledge that we produce, how, what are the interests of us indigenous researchers and also how do we accommodate the interests of the research community? So all these are the kind of conversation that we had in our mind as we constructed our project. Now, uh, when, we, when we move forward, 
And then we, uh, we, we went to implementation, but as we, before we did implementation, we also uh, had to reach out to the indigenous communities. Uh, these are people who are not uh, educated formally. Uh, the English word would say they're illiterate, but we decide, we try to stay away from using those kind of uh, language, which appears condescending to certain indigenous community and to non-English speakers. But then we rather prefer people who have not got formal education, because we know everybody is literate in one way or the other. So we organize question, and then we uh, we organize question in a way that uh, invoke discussion. First of all, on the way we organize research on our research methodology and how we can center participant in the conversation. So our research invoke question, participant get feedback, and then we engage in the collective sharing of the knowledge that is generated, and that relate back to uh, the reciprocity, uh, responsibility, uh, and then re the relationship building. Now, as part of the research design. Uh, we ask participants also what they feel uh, from the collective insight generated and how that can be shared and discussed with people in different contexts outside the research community. Now, uh, we do not leave it to professional researchers. We decide not to leave it to the professional researchers, but rather to highlight in sharing and further discussion with, with study participants. So we found this to be so intriguing because in the process of conversation, participants were able to tell us a lot of things uh, what they constructed uh, from the study that we, uh, that I mean, what their interpretation of the main ideas that were generated from the study and how they wanted this to be understood by people outside their context, which to me was very intriguing because initially uh, uh, walking into this community, one would think that you're simply going to, you know, get knowledge uh, and also kind of share what you are, but reaching there, you realize that it's more than just get, going to get knowledge, but it's also going to build relationship, uh, making friendship, and then collectively generating knowledge. Knowledge about issues that are of pertinent concern in these two different communities. And by the way, these communities had no relationship to each other. They are several miles apart from each other. So we conducted the first study in 2020, and then the second study in 2021. And that's the one uh, uh, that uh, that's the one which was published in Qualitative Inquiry, and so uh, uh, this uh, uh, this this part of uh, this methodology of doing the study brought in what we call indigenous research methodology alongside the conventional research methodology such as the Qualitative Inquiry and the Quantitative Methodology. Now uh, we extracted uh, the Norma provided an extract from. Uh, uh, myself uh, article. that came from this from our joint article yeah from our joint article and we can see it it says in such a ceremony people professional researchers and research participants are of our core researchers they all participate in knowledge construction C can together build a climate whether they are where they are ready to step beyond the everyday and accept a raised state of consciousness as they reconsider their thinking in relationship with each other. Now, she then draws example from Chilisa, uh, which we see right there. Now, but what I would like to talk about is the last part, the introduction of the sacred element into the research process. So during the construction of our study, when we went to the community, we did not simply superimpose our conventional method of conducting study, which is given to us from the university and the ivory tower, all part of the ethical uh, uh, approval, but rather we let the community draw up the program. So with the, with the leadership of the local chief, they came up with a program and their first program, the first agenda on the program was you begin with a prayer. So as Norma stated, a prayer begins every, every research meeting. It reminds the community that they are working together and developing a new understanding and for a common good that connects them to each other and to all the creation. Now, people acknowledge that as human beings, we have that closely web of connection. But then we also have that close, close web of connection extending beyond the human. It goes to the living and to the non-living. So uh, I found it so intriguing how participants were able to identify someone to conduct that prayer. And I was like, when they said, okay, we need to start with a prayer. So I was kind of taken back. I'm like, okay, uh, I hope they're not going to ask me to do a prayer. And anyway, then, this, then the chairperson, then the chief said, uh, ask for a volunteer. 
And then a lady put up her hand and conducted a prayer. What I found so intriguing is that the folks there have no, they don't really care. They have very little regard on which faith foundation one is leading a prayer. What is important is that we need to pay homage and respect to the supernatural world, acknowledging that there is a being beyond our physical and that always guide and see the way we do our thing and is interested or are interested in our activity and in our well-being. So in indigenous ways of knowing, seers and scholars in various parts of the globe do not separate out the different domain of existence. Knowing is therefore seen as relational to the common good, as Norman did put, put it in here. So we also saw the transdisciplinarity of the ways of knowing, and then how these need to be encouraged and also need to be involved in the collective deliberation. Now, so uh, that is a kind of a quick sense of how we generated the, the conversation, but what we saw explicitly clear and experience that we drew from there is the notion of democratic participation and equal participation, the issue of inclusivity and how the men and the women sat. Uh, they did not mix the men sat on the other side and then the lady sat on this side uh, while we sat somewhere across. So we kind of form a circle, but the circle were in a group, like three group of people uh, in a circle. And so that's how the conversation was going back and forth while we were playing the moderation role. But we also noticed that the chief of the village came in a lot of time to try to help the people conceptualize that which we were communicating. The good news is that the chief understood English. And so he could uh, navigate back and forth between the local language and also uh, the, the English language, which we were using in the communication. So as Norma uh, put it here, uh, to regenerate true democracy, uh, the, uh, there is multiple citation here, and then there is a regeneration of truth, the focus on community, well-being in total, and not on strengthening alliances between the big businesses. Now, uh, in that community, the first community, there was this multinational cooperation that came into the community with the aim of empowering the community. And But later, what transpired, what turned out to be is that this business was not interested in empowering the community, but rather in exploiting the community. So participants were able to uh, reflect on their experiences engaging this multinational cooperation that was given a tax waiver by the state uh, hey, to Francis. conduct business. Yes. This is such an interesting um, approach because it, it rings really true for me in Australia. And I guess I have some uh, questions, if you don't mind, I'd love to ask you because, you know, in the research that I'm I'm doing, it, it really is working with the most vulnerable people. And as Norma said at the beginning, we're talking from an Indigenous lens about this today. So working with the most marginalised and most at risk that we often, our communities put people at risk. And so for us in Australia, research um, that's been done on Indigenous people previously has often been used against Indigenous people. So it's looked at the weaknesses or perceived weaknesses from colonial uh, perspectives around um, what is right or wrong in communities. And so this way, we have this saying in, in Australia now around research is nothing about us without us. And I, I think what you're talking about here is this lovely way of going, well, how are we developing research uh, that meets the needs of communities? How are communities telling us as researchers what would they like us to look at rather than researchers always setting the agenda? So I'm, I'm really interested in how you're contextualizing that. And so has that is this where this work has come from in this way of working is because the work has been done with your communities and been used against them often in, in terms of the outcomes of that research? Or as you're saying, this, this large corporation coming in wanting something and actually not putting anything back into the community. I think that is quite interesting. So based on our experience, I would say it's both. In the first place, uh, we have this uh, multinational cooperation coming into the community and uh, because they, they realize the how, how fertile the land is, how strategically located the, that, that land is, 
and the community is, and then how nobody, let me use that language, was exploiting the community. And so they saw this huge opportunity to come in under the guise of empowering the community. And they came in through the state actors. The government endorsed their coming. The president gave them tax waiver. And at the opening, there was a prime minister. And there was this huge expectation that they would lead to job creation and doing all the wonderful things that would lead to social economic empowerment of the community. But what panned out to be was actually not what they promised. And so this led to a lot of complaint by the community and it piqued our interest, myself and Norma. And so we went into work. Meanwhile, on the other side too, we also saw, we, we have often felt the need to conduct a study on the areas of uh, indigenous social movement, organic people social movement. And so we were like, okay, where can we, uh, uh, Let's look around the, the, the continent. First of all, I say, let's look around Uganda, then we look around the continent and see how indigenous community have demonstrated uh, the, the potential, they have demonstrated their agency to stand firm against a new colonial method of exploitation, which are coming under the disguise either of education, religion, or anything, maybe international cooperation or agency, or in the form of foreign aid. And, and so looking around and then doing a lot of reading, and myself coming from Northern, from Uganda. So I was in this community. Then I was like, oh, you know what, Norma? I think we found something that might be of interest to us. So yeah, to go back to your question, I think uh, I could look at it in both ways. But in, in summary, we see indigenous people coming together to demonstrate their agency against an exploitation from a multinational corporation endorsed by the sitting government uh, that often kept praising and even trying to deny them justice until when they stood up for their right and said, no, we have to put a final stop to this. So then they brought their experience in our study. And that took us a lot of time. First of all, constructing the study itself wasn't easy because sometimes we would write here and then Norma would say, okay, do you think this would resonate with the indigenous community? And then we would go back and forth, have conversation with them, the setting up the focus group discussion and the talking circle. All that was, I could say, although we were the researchers, but all that was facilitated by them. And that's, that's also a really important point about what I think needs to change in research as well as around this context of um, often we will get a grant in, in research and we just jump in with a question that we want answered or it's gone out to tender and we do that. And this idea that you're talking about there, Francis, is it's... It, it takes time to build relationships with communities, to build that idea of safety, to want to engage with you in, in research. And so you cannot rush research in this way. And I think that's something that we do need to look at changing is how, how do we push back and say, well, hang on a minute, we can't do this work with this community or whether it's Indigenous or not, or this group, until we actually set the grounds of safety? How do we create the safe space for us all as researchers and community, create that safe environment to come together to then do the work of research? Um, it takes Taking that extra time can also really help with setting what's, what is the question we're really wanting to answer? Is it a question that researchers want answered or is it the question that community want answered? And so actually taking that time to slow down, you're minimising the risk of alienating community and also doing research in what we're both talking about early on there, Francis and Norma, is doing it in the wrong ways that actually aren't looking at the strength bases of communities that are actually detrimental to the outcomes of how communities can use it, eh? Right. Ah. I see Nelly wants to talk, by the way, she's raised her hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my brother from Uganda. This is Nelly Dirango from Kenya, uh, just a neighboring country, uh, which I, I really appreciate you for what you have shared. And I feel like uh, I now have a colleague whom I can consult with just next door. Uh, now, what I wanted to share is about um, the research, the research that uh, we did a bit, uh, what was uh, sponsored by Taos in the year 2019 to Kim Awareness Foundation, uh, which is now my foundation, which I've founded with other members. And uh, in Kiswahili, we said, to Kai to Semesane, let us sit down and listen together. I know that journal is somewhere. Uh, you can be able to Google and see that journal by Nelly Dirango and others uh, to Kai to Semesane. Let us sit down and reason together. This echoes back what we are talking about, that whenever we want to go to the community, 
we have first of all to request them can we sit down and listen together because for them they have their own values the values that have made them to stay together the values that have aligned the kind of life that they are uh, they are living so uh, we cannot just say that uh, since we have the resources we have the funding we just ignore the cultural aspect at one point i also wrote a brief encounter whereby we thought we have all the resources to go to that community but what happened uh, we went to the community and they stared at us, at us. they were like what are you coming to tell us I, I, i'm talking of um, when we visited the hotspot areas of the post election violence in kenya and we wanted to know why the members in that community we are fighting some calling themselves the host community and others we are being called the displaced persons that they were not born in that area they bought pieces of land and others they claimed that the predecessors their leaders had given them land for free like uh, president kenyatta from kenya the old president kenyatta not the current uh, the, the one who just retired the father to the retired president it was being uh, said or rumored in that community that those members they got their land illegally and therefore after every five five years there is a post election violence and the members have to be told central is your home place not in the rift valley so when i i was supported by taos uh, to do this brief encounter i thought it was going to be very easy so we walked with the knowledge to the community thinking that we have all what it took we had the assistant researchers we had the money with us for transport we had money for with us to buy food for the the group that we are going to host but this you did nothing they told us we have our own cultures let us sit down and reason together and that brought us our journal which we were to write later uh, let us sit down and reason together in our local language to kai to semesane the research uh, in the community you have to engage them uh, like our brother has said uh, with uh, nothing without us nothing without us i pick that with a lot of uh, uh, energy you cannot impose values to us we have our own values much as you see us uh, as indigenous group remote group we have our own values and we cannot divert from our own values then they also said that we are not tabularizer we are not empty headed we have something in our brain so for you to drive for you to drill out whatever you need the information you need from our brain because we are not empty headed that is why you have come to us so we had to sit down and allow them to be and that came to be that let us sit down and reason together thank you that is what i wanted to echo in the conversation thank you nelly i think um one of the things that when when i listen to you is is how do we include uh leadership indigenous leadership in research development and i don't mean just as participants i'm thinking of how do we include indigenous leadership in the, not just the development of it but it is who's actually analyzing the data who's actually sitting on steering committees around research and making sure um and then in the dissemination and i know we will probably touch on dissemination of reports and and findings as well um from sally and dan but having indigenous leadership at all levels of research actually makes it more inclusive it's not just the development of the project and then say thank you very much we then go out and collect our data and 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 that's it and so the other really important thing there uh nelly i can't see you on my screen anymore but is is data sovereignty who owns this research post um you know the the application of going in collecting it writing about it and sending it out and so actually having honest discussions and 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 i mean deep honest discussions at the very beginning of research that looks at how do you do data sovereignty and ownership for communities um particularly when we are have said a couple of times tonight and this morning is around they the groups that we work with are the most marginalized and often most um disconnected from the work that that we're doing just want to maybe interject here um I know the time is going by quickly and I want to make sure that we have time for 
uh, Francis and uh, Norma to get their stuff in and David for you to have time. So Francis, uh, how far along are you? And uh, I've been turning it over to David. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I, I would like to actually appreciate Nelly and David for their interjection because yeah. uh, these are researchers in different contexts. David is in Australia, Nelly is in Kenya, mm -hmm. I'm here in Uganda, Norma in South Africa, but we can see the connectivity in terms of the work that we are doing in the different contexts. And to me, that is the power of critical scholarship because our scholarship should be seen in the way that it contributes to those who are considered to the minority group and the voiceless to be able to have a voice within the platform of knowledge generation and in a way that contribute to making their society a better place. I am almost uh, at the exit, uh, but I would like to say a few things in terms of the work that Norman and I have been, to, have, have been doing here in Uganda. And uh, our work mainly uh, focus on appreciating the purpose for conducting research, because as social scientists and as indigenous researchers and all indigenous oriented researchers, we approach our work from the point of humility, with the aim of bringing a positive change in the life of the research community. I like the concept that Nelly was bringing to Kai to Semesana. Let's sit and have a conversation. So to me, this is what many indigenous scholars and indigenous oriented scholars would call a responsible research practice. And all the responsible research practice are tied in what I said earlier in the four R's. Now, if I can speak briefly, reflecting on what we did. So what are the four R's? So when we talk of the four R's, uh, we can talk of relational ontology and how the big question that we are asking ourselves is that, how are we, like my, myself and Norma, how are we going to contribute uh, in, the, uh, in the research community? How are we contributing our role in the research community in a way that build positive relationship, in a way that foster inclusivity, that also celebrate the diversity in that community? Much as they speak the same language, they're still diverse. They're diverse in all aspects of life. So often, uh, when we ask this question, we were reflecting also uh, in the critical role to uh, that we needed, uh, that we as scholars, as researchers, bring in that community and the power relation that we see embedded in us. And, you know, and then you see this whole aspect of educated, not educated, using language that are so condescending to certain people. So we are trying to stay away from that, but build a culture of coming, of, of collective respect. And then the aspect of the relational or epistemology, the way we, we took this is that uh, we were asking ourselves, so that which we know, Norman and I, that which we already know, which we call knowledge, how are we born with that? And how are we gaining it from our everyday struggle? And how are we going to use that which we already know to reinforce the relationship in the new community? So that also went on to all the aspects of the methodology. But lastly, there is the relational methodology. Uh, in this, we were asking ourselves that uh, we are stepping outside the conventional or the institutionally acceptable research approaches. So Norma was saying, oh, Francis, did you get ethical approval? I said, yes, Norma, we are working on it, but the ethical approval is not uh, in tangent with the indigenous ways of doing things. So we need, we, we had to have a back and forth conversation because the, my university requires the people to sign, but these people are not happy to sign because number one, most of them cannot read and write, so imposing a pen and paper to them uh, was more than they could take. So Norma said, you know what, there's another way they can do it. Just ask them to give oral consent. So you just ask them, do you first tell them what the study is about and then ask them if they accept to participate. And so they were so happy to give oral consent. Uh, and so uh, when I was at the University of South Africa, I remember Norma also took us through what we call the multiplicity of research design. Uh, which multiple scholars are now calling multiple mixed method research. So we kind of invoke that. And then in the process of conducting our study, we brought in now the indigenous research methodology to ground the study. And at the end of the day, we realized that the institutional conventional research approach uh, was not working. And so much as we use it in the construction of the proposal and later in the write-up, but the actual conduct of the research focus on indigenous research approach in which they were the main, they were the center stage. Then that fit into what David was talking about, the actual dissemination, and then who owns the research and how is the research making a difference? So we had to go back to the community at their request 
and we move beyond mere dissemination and validation of finding. But they were also asking us that, can you make our voice to be heard to the government? We need action taken in as far as the injustices being meted against us by the multinational corporation is concerned. So we had to bring in the National Environment Management Authority based on our write-up and some action were taken. So I would say, uh, you know, the theme of the theme of this session is so relevant to the multiple challenges that research has, and also to the potential that research can contribute to society and to contribute to what we call responsible ways of conducting research that gives back to research community, leaving research community much better than the way we found it. Mm. Thank you. Okay. I want to say one quick thing, sure. um, and that is also that we ask the participants what they thought we should highlight when we wrote our articles for even in academia, when we wrote books, what did they want to share around the world? So, so that they they felt that it was what they wanted us to highlight when we shared it. So it wasn't us saying, you know, this is what we found so-called. It was asking them what did they think was important. Mm -hmm. So um, that is why when we wrote up the research, we also took cognizance of what they said we should make important for other people to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Francis and Norma. Uh, and thanks for squeaking out some words there. We know that you're dealing with laryngitis, so thanks for saving some words for us. David? David, you look ready to jump in. Thanks for your contributions. Now, tell us a little bit more. Yeah, and please, Francis and Norma, keep jumping in. Um, I'm much more comfortable. Maybe it's just who I am and just yarning and, and chatting around these issues. Uh, it just resonates a lot about what you're both saying around your work. Um, I'm going to complicate it a little bit by saying that, yes, I've introduced myself as an Aboriginal person and I'm very um, focused and strong around how I think we should do research. But one of the things in Australia particularly is really important is that I'm just one Indigenous person. Um, and so the importance of understanding that I can't speak for all Indigenous people or ways of knowing and doing around research for all Indigenous people as well. And so this importance of there's no... Often in the, the Western lens, we, we come up with a formula or a mathematic formula to do research um, and we can go to a book and go, right, this is the, the methodology and the methods and this is how we're going to conduct that. But actually you'll find um, in Australia, I mean, there's so many different mobs, there's over 200 here, um, that there are going to be slight nuances. Some things might be similar in the ways that they want uh, you to participate with them around research. So actually it's it's something I think is is just as important in this conversation is realizing that it's not just within my own country how different it can be, but then even when you expand that out, if I want to go over to um, New Zealand uh, to the land of the long white cloud, Aotearoa, and work with Maori people and how different that would be again. And I can't just assume the way that I've thought about doing research in this context is always going to be the right way of doing research. So it's always evolving, I think, Francis and Norma and, and Sally and Dan that we always need to keep a mind to that is that whilst it may work once it, you know we need to revisit that every time hey eh? Francis absolutely I, I cannot agree with you more than what you said I, I think the importance of being open and uh, revisiting our work because we should always be improving on our practices bearing in mind that uh, colonization and new colonial arrangement keeps changing shapes every day. And also mm. we, we these days we have new ways of uh, oppression against minority groups and people who are considered, you know, uh, incapable of speaking for themselves. So I, I think I like what you say, David, we need to be watching out for all the traces, for all the characteristics and behaviors of how this keeps changing, taking shape. And then we as scholars, we have the, uh, the, the noble responsibility to address those systemic issues as they arise in society. Because a lot of time uh, when we approach communities that we think are incapable of doing work for themselves, uh, we realize there's a huge potential there, but the, uh, the methodology and the approach that is taken there can be deceptive in a way that, if not pointed out to them, can lead to signing contracts or signing treaties or signing uh, uh, participation in a study that are detrimental to them. 
And, and, you know, what I've found in doing uh, when I'm welcomed into communities to do work with them, particularly in the space of family violence, as I've been lucky enough to do over the last five years particularly, is I've taken a lot of what I've learned about doing research into more my general research. So what we find, uh, and I certainly agree with some of the sayings that we have here, is if you get it right with Indigenous communities, you can get it right for all people because of this, the pace in which we do it and we develop and think about doing the research. And I can give you many instances of um, how I've taken that into my broader research. So um, as an example, and you mentioned ethics before, Francis, and how ethics can be so rigid is working in the prison environment, um, you know, who can meet, um, you know, informed consent and who, and who doesn't is quite a rigid process within an academic sense and re, uh, a university sense. And so um, often I would be talking to someone who quite clearly either had um, a bad day at the, at the least, struggling with mental health potentially, or had cognitive disability. Um, now, I'm not a doctor that can make any of those diagnoses. But according to ethics, you know, that makes it very difficult in getting informed consent. And often in research, what we would do at that point is, thank you, Sally, thank you, Francis, but um, you're, you're not the right fit for our research, but we appreciate you coming down. What I found in the prison environment, particularly, it's, it's quite um, in your face, is Lots of people actually wanted to come and talk to you because it's the you're the only person they might have spoken to for that week, for that month, potentially even for that year, getting out of their cell to come all the way across a prison environment to then come and speak with you. And I sat there thinking, I wouldn't do this in community. This is not what I would do. Now, contrasting that with ethics is what often I would say is I'd actually continue to have a conversation with, with that person that may not meet informed consent. They would become informers to my research and my research thinking, but they may not be participants. So it wasn't a recorded interview. It wasn't data that I could take away from my interviews. But you know what? I was acknowledging that person's interest and want to come and sit with me and share their story. And what I found through my research, often, whilst it might be only a 15-minute conversation with some people, sometimes it goes to half an hour, is that what they give me informs what I can do and have discussions with other people that I talk to in my research. And so that just that connection and the, and the importance of relationships and you've, you've said that, Norma and, and Francis, across your slides, you know, relational, it was the first word for each of those steps. That is such an important aspect in conducting the research. And I think we can all get better at thinking about that. If we're asking people for their time, how do we include them, even though they may not be a part of a research process in the way that we think about it? Another example I can give you, which is just another little anecdote story, is um, the, the rapidness in which we need to try and create rapport with someone to get them involved in the study. Um, you know, again, this is in a women's prison environment on this occasion. And I was told that a, an auntie, and a, an elder Aboriginal woman was the key to unlocking my research and getting participants involved in the research. And so I went straight to her in the yard and went, hi, I'm David and I'm from this university and this is what I do. And, and aunt just looked at me and went, oh, okay, yep, well, that's good for you, but um, I'm off to play softball. If you'd like to join me, you can. And I thought, right. <laughs> What a great opportunity to create relationship very quickly with this person and get them involved in the study. And so aunt had been in an altercation in the prison environments um, not that long ago and had some knee issues. And so aunt said, well, can you run for me? And I said, well, I'd be happy to run for you, aunt. Anything to please this person to get them involved in the study. So aunt hits the ball and it goes beyond the diamond because uh, softball is quite a, a popular sport with women in prison in Australia. And I run around the diamonds thinking, yes, this is very nice. And then the ball came back and I got to home base and aunt said, will you run for me again? I said, of course, aunt, I'll run for you again. This happened about four or five times. Now, I'm a researcher in sport. I'm not an athlete. So I'm starting to tire at this point. <laughs> And I get back to home base on about the fifth or sixth time. And aunt says to me, Dave, just run for me again. And I thought, oh, you know what? I need a rest. So I went up to aunt. I thought I'd done my job in making my connection. I had to get in and get out with my interviews. I was moving to another prison the next day. These things are going through my mind. And I said to aunt, I just can't. Let someone else have a go. And she just wandered up to me very closely into my ear and said, I will stab you like I stabbed my brother. I got back to the plate. I was ready to go again and run around. 
this was me trying to force a relationship. Now, this aunt had me by by the short hair, as you would say, in the fact that she was actually just playing with me, I'm sure. She knew that I was a researcher, that I was trying to build this rapport, and I was trying to rush that. Now, you could take that as an example of Francis and, and Norma we were talking about in going into communities. This is my research. We've got to get, you know, we'd love you to participate. We want you involved, and we get it done. The relationship isn't built in the right way. And so each of these small things you can take as a researcher into your practice. Whilst we're talking about Aboriginal communities, I found it just so helpful for the researchers that I generally do. I think one of the things that I, um, as I listen to you, that I think you've been bringing up and that I've seen more people writing about is kind of this insider outsider, you know, who's part of what community and what are the questions that need to get asked. And so I, I think um, we need to think more about that um, because I, I'm not sure that I think anybody's a pure insider or a pure outsider. But if we start with the relationship, um, you know, we we will have some ideas about what's troublesome and what does need changing. Um, I think one of the other thing that probably gets mixed up, David, as you were talking about in your story is who gets credit? <laughs> Who gets credit for doing the research? You know, we don't get credit for just assisting, at least in academia. And so I also think that that's one of the questions we need, I, I think that we need to put forward and think about if we have research understandings, knowledge, experience, how does that get used? Anyways, that was something that that's up for me as I've been listening to you. That's really important, Sally, and this goes to that idea of data sovereignty in, in, you know, that's a very big, broad concept around who owns and how do we acknowledge people. But, um, you know, it, it's been time and time even a conversation within my own department and my university is that often when I do work in communities, if I've got an advisory group, those advisory members become authors on my papers. Now, they may not have written the paper, they may not have analysed the data, they may not have even helped editing in any way that we think about what authorship looks like but without their thought process and thinking to develop my ideas I wouldn't have that paper so often they'll be um, authors and again it's a discussion not all of them want to take that up but we put that on the table is that actually that's their work as well um, and so that's a, an ongoing conversation uh, particularly in universities in Australia because uh, say for my department and my field of social work is that you know normally you would only have two or three authors and so and journals are looking for only two or three authors so when you start to submit papers with 10 um, you know you can get desktop rejected straight away and so you'd have to argue and say well this is why and and sometimes you win that and and the journal will go through but um, other other times it's um, find that the next journal editor that would be interested yeah what did you call it data sovereignty what data sovereignty, sovereignty is this idea of and it, it's such a big concept, but it's the ownership of the data is who gets to use it afterwards, who actually controls the information that we get. And this is this idea of our communities here in Australia are so interested um, to make sure that research comes from a strengths-based. Now, you might be looking at things like child removal, which has become a, an even bigger issue in Australia, particularly with Aboriginal kids who are now being removed at greater rates than when they were being removed through what we call the stolen generations. So through colonisation, mm -hmm. a particularly terrible term. And so you might be looking at these terrible issues and these issues that really need us to look at, but what are the strengths based? So what, how are Aboriginal families keeping kids safe? So how do we draw that out? And so it's reframing the research altogether from that Western lens. It's always looking at the, the shortfall or the detriment is to what is actually working. How do we promote that more? You know, one of the things I've noticed all three of you have kind of emphasized, and I want to just insert this, is that you're inviting the research community to expand or extend the way it thinks of itself. You know, it's kind of we have a Western kind of attitude, but all of the projects that you're talking about invite us through um, who gets to participate, the ethical considerations, who controls the data, how will the reports be made, who will they be made to. You're, you're saying to the research community, you're too narrow. There's more possibilities about what could be done with research. And so I can, I can hear the excitement in your voices about the, the ways in which research could be more than we've come to see it to be. So I think there's great potential for, 
for all researchers to kind of hear your message that don't be confined to a box. Don't just think within the narrow range of what we've always done. So it's, it's an example of what Ken Gergen talks about future forming research. We're talking about research practices being formed for the future rather than just play the game the way it's always been. Yeah, I, I think I like that part, uh, Dan. I, I, I like when you brought the issue of stepping outside the box and uh, we are speaking to the research community to appreciate that they're actually missing something outside there. Uh, there's something beyond the conventional. And David did talk rightly about the data sovereignty. I would like to, I would like to reflect uh, quickly uh, when I was still a, a, a doctoral student at the University of Toronto. So we, we identified ourselves with other people from the United States uh, in, at, I think, Penn State University, and we were constructing a very nice proposal to conduct research um, in an indigenous community in Africa. Everything was going so well until when we came to the issue of intellectual property right. Yeah, so we, uh, because we were, we, we had the prospect of getting a lot of money from US dollar, Department uh, of Homeland, something, something. Now, the Penn State, wanted to own the IP. And we said, no, this is not right. <laughs> so we, 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 we had multiple conversations until when we reached a point where we say, you know what, we cannot do this. So the partnership collapsed before it even took off, but there was a huge potential. The only problem is the ownership of the intellectual property, what is going to be collected. In our opinion, we felt like the research community should have the intellectual property right. We, the researcher, that is the partners, the collaborator, uh, the consortium should also have the intellectual property right. But this one university, because of being the ivory tower and placing itself so much above others and being celebrated as a world university and have everything, say, okay, well, we'll give you the money, but the IP belongs to us. So I think these are some of the issues that we as scholars need to continuously be looking out for and devise clever ways that will not severe relationship, but rather bring the point up in a way that we cannot keep reproducing status quo that are not helping community grow. Uh, when you get knowledge from a people, in my opinion, such people should also have intellectual property right. And then when it comes to data sover sovereignty and the data management, they should also have a voice in it. So that was what I thought I should add to what David just concluded with. And I think, you know, that, that really touches on Dan's points around we can continue to do what we do the way we do it, um, but we're perpetuating, uh, particularly for our, our communities, colonial ways in the fact that land was stolen. So now you're talking about continuing to do research in a way where data is, you can draw the parallel of being stolen it is being taken you are taking the knowledge of others uh, that you wouldn't normally get without their assistance so we've got to be very careful around that and the other thing around the title to this whole talk is this you know two 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 worlds is as an aboriginal person i walk in those two worlds i walk in the western world of research and i walk in the world of my community and if i'm doing bad by my community that reflects on me and I don't, I can't keep those relationships. And so for me, um, it has that, that real um, issue, I think, as an Aboriginal researcher or an Indigenous researcher in this space, is I actually always have to pay attention to that because it's not just my job and my, uh, how people view me as an academic, but it's how people are going to view me as a community member as well. If it's okay with you, David, Norma and Francis, maybe we could take the few minutes that we have towards the end here and see if there are any questions. Thank you, Nelly, for your question earlier and your comments. Are there other things that people would like to say or ask of our, of, of our group today? Or insert in terms of answering the questions that we posed. We'd like to hear your ideas too. Anybody have anything you'd like to put into the chat or? Just raise your hand or just or unmute and unmute and say it. or perhaps everything has been said by our presenters you know there's nothing more to add thank you when we are talking of um indigenous people do you hear me Kaidre? am i being heard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes thank you now then clear uh, uh, Thank you. When we are talking of uh, indigenous people, indigenous communities, 
I feel this is where we are. Uh, most of the researches have been done in the West. Now that you people are around, we can now start moving to Africa and doing a lot of research with the people who innocently lie there in the rural areas and uh, they are suffering somehow and nobody has come to their rescue. So I think the way to go future farming for towns, it is expanding towards the community, the area that has remained hitherto to others and that we can be able to maybe help these communities to also feel they are part of the larger world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, much appreciated, Nelly. Uh, these are very powerful conversation. And I want to just build from what Nelly says, the issue of uh, including the voices of minority group, indigenous people, indigenous community in research and in all spheres of life is gaining traction so rapidly in the Western world. And I'm, I'm glad, David, uh, the work you're doing in Australia and my colleagues in Canada, United States and Europe, uh, but in the context of Africa, these are conversations which are yet beginning to match room. So like Nelly Wright has stated, uh, we need to, you know, uh, to work as allies, we work as partnership and construct discourses, counter discourses uh, to ones that have often been placed in a way that denigrate and place indigenous community at a disadvantage. Uh, we need to cascade the net beyond the West. Uh, we need to bring uh, the uh, formerly society that have been left out of the conversation on the same table. So I really want to commend you so much for that, Nelly. Now, I, I want to touch on briefly uh, on the last part of the question, that uh, which says, why do you think we need to pay, uh, I think, more attention to changing our ways of doing research projects? Uh, I think this is a very important question, uh, colleagues. And in my opinion, uh, there, there are I think it's it's crucial and we need to pay close attention to it because we need to get feedback to research community. Based on the study that Norm and I conducted, one of the things they were talking of is feedback, uh, going back to the research community and having a conversation with them. In the uh, ivory tower, we, we can call it a study validation or validation of finding, but indigenous community call it feedback. They want to know the knowledge that we took from them. How did we construct it? Then out, so when we went back and read with them, they were so pleased to say, okay, this is exactly what we said, but then in this one, we didn't say it this way, or we felt like you left out A, B, C, and D. And in the process of doing feedback, they were also interested to understand how are we going to share their knowledge with the world, like Norma Wright stated, and how are we going to uh, to, to pass on this information to their government to try to make a difference. And then the next thing why I think is important to change our ways of yeah. doing things is the old notion of inclusivity. Because when we start honoring that the real honor of the knowledge are those who gave it to us. So they are being included both in the write-up and in the way that the knowledge is going to be disseminated to others. And then mm -hmm. I also want to talk about honoring of the contribution of other knowledge system and appreciating that one size all, I mean, one size does, and appreciating that the one size fit all does not work. We move, we live in a time and ages when society is changing, culture is changing, the way knowledge is produced is changing. The reason why we produce knowledge is changing. And then we also need to know that as researchers, we are not innocent in the process, in the project of knowledge production, but sometimes we bring our own biases that we tend to superimpose. So all this goes to the one size does not fit or doesn't work. And, and finally, I think it's also important that we look into the issue of treating participants like David Wright stated, which Norm and I also reiterated that uh, participants are not only seen as participants or subject, but rather they are core knowledge producers. They are not mere study subjects. They have a huge responsibility to play. As a matter of fact, we, they are the one producing the knowledge. We are only facilitating the process of knowledge production. So honoring that relation is so important and, and it feeds into the principle of social justice, which is creating equitable space for everybody, regardless of the status, the class, the group, ethnicity, the tribe, or language, it creates a space for all of them to exercise their full potential and realize their place in the global community of knowledge production. So this is what I thought I should bring up here to wrap it up. And it fit right into what Nelly was talking about, uh, to invite our colleagues to explore uh, this conversation to Africa, and then we start having this conversation in all these other spaces that indigenous voices have not previously been honored, or the voices of minority group have not been previously honored on the platform of knowledge production. Thank you. 
Zafnat, you can hop in. Hi, 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 Dan. Good to see you here. Mm -hmm. It's been a while. Yes. Dan was my advisor for my PhD. Um, you know, I I came to engage in different things here. It's so it's interesting for me. The research was very interesting. Um, I like switched my uh, engaging mode to listening very attentively to what is being said here. So it was interesting. A question, I had something, a specific research that um, I'm thinking of doing and wanted to do it more in a social constructionist way. It's not about uh, involving indigenous uh, people in any way. It's, in, uh, it's a different thing. Uh, and I was hoping to engage in that, but we don't have time. Um, and the question that is raised for me um, attending this session is how can we walk the talk? I mean, we're talking so much about inclusivity, engagement, interaction, relationships, and how can we um, do that in, you know, in this session or other sessions? How do we not just talk about what we believe in, but, but really doing it? in whatever we do. So this is uh, my challenge in life. So um, since I cannot share anything um, about what you said about your research, um, I was not involved in it, um, except that it's fascinating um, and not about my research. So um, that's what I, I want to say um, now. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, and I think you raise a couple of really good questions that I would urge us all to think about, and that's that um, to 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 what degree? Um, oh no, I forgot what I was going to say. Hang on. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Oh, One, it's the, about change. No, yeah, it, it, I'm sorry. It, it's about the timing of the change. It's like we do things. It seems like we traditional research does things in terms of stages. You know, we have to do this step and then this step and this step, instead of, I think, rolling it into, if we really wanna do what we need to do, then we need to find out what's troublesome so that we can actually conduct the change as we're studying things with others so that they become, those who join us, um, we all become the beneficiaries of what's taking place right there, as opposed to, we'll tell you later. I think yeah. that's one of my problems. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll be so brief. And I think Becca raised a very important question, the importance of walking the talk. We should not just be rhetoric. We should not just be radical. Every day it would be the same thing and then we are not doing it. Um, uh, I, 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 I understand your frustration uh, in terms of how we scholars have continued producing to the reproduction of the status quo in terms of conventional ways of conducting research. Uh, there are some few examples uh, which can fit into walking the talk, but they are inadequate. It's just like a drop of milk in a bucket of water or a drop of milk in an ocean. You'll never even see it. Anyway, I, I think for us, uh, what we did with the study I did with Norma, uh, maybe you came a little bit late, the, the issue of ethical approval. Now, the process, of ethical approval in institutional in institution of learning like Kavala University or University of South Africa, where the, where Norma is, uh, is that it requires us to go through the traditional way, the conventional way, and then you have to do A, B, C, and D. Now, realizing that we are going to a community that did not acquire formal education, that does not appreciate the conventional way of conducting research, we have to switch. We have to do things completely different in compliance, not with the institutional requirement but rather with the research community. So mm -hmm. in my opinion, I think this is one way we can walk the talk. The big question is how many scholars are, are willing to risk and go that journey? Yeah. Because yeah. there can also be a social cost, emotional cost, the cost of unlearning what you have learned to be the truth. And now you're coming to say that what I've learned before may be truth in one context, but may not be truth in another context. The way you learned it is that it is, a, it is a, a truth that is universally applicable. So I'll leave it to my colleagues, Norma and David, to dive in uh, and, you know, if they can uh, speak to that a little bit further. Yeah, go, go Norma, I'll come after you. Okay, I'll manage a few words then. Um, so, 
Yes, I think that what we were doing in the Ugandan research, Kiki, was precisely at all points to be allowing people to think together about options for change. So it's not that, you know, at the end we said, oh, by the way, this is what we found and let's share it with you. It was on the spot. People were busy thinking together about issues confronting them, how they had acted, what were possibilities for acting further. It all had to do with um, resisting basically the uh, injustices of the multinational corporations. But on the spot, people were developing ideas together. And that was the point of the discussions. And David, can you bring us? Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief, very yes. brief, I promise. Um, I think you can get overwhelmed by hearing this sort of conversation, as you say, where do you start? What do you do? I mean, there's so so many small things that you can do. And I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made as a researcher and continue to make. And it's learning from your mistakes uh, or ways that haven't worked. What I think many researchers are good at is copying and pasting our way of thinking is I've done this before, I'm going to do this again. It's just taking even five minutes to think about why am I going to do it this way? Is it because I've already got it in a document that I've done it before and I'm going to drop it in? Just take that five minutes to read it. If it's a data collection method, all right, this work... What is, it, what is it about the community or the people, whether it's Indigenous or not? What is the best way to collect? As Francis said, you know, uh, even thinking about oral consent versus written consent, how are you actually making your research accessible and practical to the communities you're uh, working with? So there are so many small things that you can grasp that leads to a way of working. And, uh, you know, I'm only just beginning that journey. Um, so I think, you know, many of us, don't get to the end point. You are always learning in this space. Okay. Thank you. Um, I see Dawn's here, so that usually signals uh, some closure that's coming right. for we this would, event. We would like to thank David, Norma, and Francis for sharing their ideas and for giving us an opportunity to share some of our ideas. And we appreciated hearing from all of you as well. And we hope this has been... Uh, provocative in some way so that you will think about tailoring and uh, making some changes in the way research is conducted. And we'd love to hear about it. So thank you. Okay.